This is the plumbing in your house. The blue pipes carry cold water, the red pipes carry hot water, and the larger white pipes carry wastewater into the sewer line to be treated and then cycled back into the Puget Sound. Your house is an engineered interruption in the water cycle. We grab rainwater or snowmelt, use it, and then send it back out to rejoin the greater watershed. It's plumbing. If you take away the wall coverings, this is what it looks like inside your house. These are the streams and rivers of our watershed. If you take away the buildings and streets and forests and farms, and just look at the streams and rivers that form the Green Duwamish watershed, this is what nature's plumbing looks like. Smaller streams flowing down from the ridge lines, flowing into the mainstream river, flowing out through the estuary, flowing into the Puget Sound. Historically, three mighty rivers contributed to the volume of the Green Duwamish watershed. The Cedar River, the Green River, and the White River. Historically, it was a really big system. Even bigger because Issaquah Creek, which empties into Lake Sammamish, and the Sammamish River, which loops around north and empties into Lake Washington, was also part of this watershed, at least according to nature's plumbing. Back in the day, Lake Washington emptied south and joined with the Cedar River, which crossed over to the west through the very short Black River, to join with the Green River and the White River to flow north again. Meandering through the Duwamish Valley to its estuary, where all of this incredible flow would meet Puget Sound. This is how it used to be. This is how it was since time immemorial, when the native tribes of this watershed thrived because they understood nature's plumbing. They worked with it. The seasonal floods, the salmon runs, the cedar forests. In 1906, all of this changed. In 1906, the natural plumbing of the Green Duwamish watershed was redesigned, rerouted for the growing city of Seattle and the needs of its many new industries logging, shipbuilding, fishing, coal. The native tribes had been pushed onto reservations 50 years earlier, and the newcomers imagined ways to engineer the watershed to better suit their needs. Seattle grew as a major industrial port because of this decision. Because of this decision, once incredibly abundant salmon runs began a rapid and continuous decline due to the loss of habitat and new sources of pollution. It all changed fairly quickly. In 1906, Lake Washington still flowed out its southern end through the Black River and into the Duwamish Tidal Flats. And then a bunch of things happened within a single decade. The Black River was cut off, disappeared, buried under what would become the new city of Renton. Now, as you can see, the Cedar River is flowing into Lake Washington instead of Lake Washington flowing into it. New passages were cut at Montlake, Fremont, and Ballard. In re-plumbing the Green Duwamish watershed, we cut off Cedar River, cut through Montlake at number one, cut through Fremont at number two, and built the Ballard Locks at number three. The idea was to have big ships and barges to be able to carry natural resources like lots and lots of trees and milled lumber from Lake Washington out to Pacific trade routes. The Ballard Locks took a decade to build. It was a pretty big engineering challenge. Here's what the Ballard Locks look like now. With hundreds of ships traveling in both directions every day, it's one of the busiest locks in the country. The purpose of the locks is to help boats navigate from sea level to the level of Lake Washington. It's a more than 20-foot drop in elevation. At the locks, boats are brought in between two pairs of huge iron gates, and then the water inside those gates is either drained out or pumped full, depending on whether the boat is going towards Lake Washington or towards Puget Sound. This is the moment when the Montlake Cut was breached to connect Lake Washington to Lake Union. It took only three days for the entire level of the lake to drop nine feet. Now it was easy for the Cedar River to flow north into Lake Washington. The Black River completely dried up. 
Here is the Mont Lake cut today, with hundreds of boats traveling between Lake Washington and the Ballard Locks, and thousands of cars, buses, trucks, and bikes crossing over the Mont Lake Bridge to get to the University of Washington, which is just to the left of this image. The Fremont Dam, just before a channel was cut to connect Lake Union to Salmon Bay. The Fremont cut today and the Fremont Bridge. The Ballard Locks are just up ahead a couple of miles. This photo was taken in 1940, opening day for the I-90 floating bridge. A whole series of cement barges connect the road surface above from one side of Lake Washington to the other. Bellevue and the east side really began to grow. And here is what the I-90 floating bridge looks like today. By the time you see this video, there will probably be a light rail down the middle lane. A second floating bridge was built, Highway 520 connecting the north end of Bellevue to the University of Washington. These two floating bridges absolutely depend on the lake staying at a certain water level. If too much water flows into Lake Washington in the rainy winter, as it used to do, naturally, or too much water evaporates in the hot, dry summer, as it used to do, naturally, these two bridges would buckle and collapse. Water flow in the Cedar River has to be managed very carefully to ensure that floating bridges float and the Ballard Locks have enough water to move boats back and forth. We have re-engineered the watershed, re-plumbed it. So now we have to manage the system we created with considerable precision. When all this engineering was complete, the Black River was eliminated from the natural system. The Cedar River was no longer associated with the Green Duwamish watershed. Now only two rivers were left to feed the flow of the natural river and to receive salmon returning home to find a very altered habitat. Only the Green River and the White River remained. This area, the confluence of the Green River and the White River, was exceptionally rich farmland because it was low and flat and fed by so many small streams. It flooded here frequently. It's natural for rivers to flood on a seasonal basis in the lowlands, this is what causes the soil to become so full of nutrients. Indigenous people knew this. They depended on it. They worked with the seasons. But the newcomers, the people who took this land over, cut down the forest, drained the wetlands into ditches so that they could take advantage of the fertile soil and grow economically viable crops. But the river kept flooding as it naturally wanted to do and this would ruin the farmer's fields. There was a small river called the Stuck that ran parallel and very close to the White River. It naturally drained into the Puyallup River, which has its estuary in Tacoma. Sometimes, big log jams of fallen trees would clog up one bend of the river or another, causing the floodwaters to either flow north or south. King County farmers would prevent floods on their land to the north by dynamiting log jams and bluffs diverting the White River into the stuck. This flooded Pierce County farms to the south, so Pierce County farmers would then dynamite other log jams and bluffs, which would send the White River back up north, flooding King County farms. It went on like this for years, widening the stuck river. On November 14, 1906, it all became moot. Heavy rains and a warm wind from the north began melting the snow near Mount Rainier. Floodwaters in the valley rose at a rate of two inches an hour, and within hours, everything south of Kent was deluged. Some buildings were almost completely submerged. A few days later, water began receding at a rapid rate. In some places, it dropped more than four feet an hour. A massive log jam of trees and debris had pushed the White River so forcefully into the Stuck River that it broke through the narrow spot and completely diverted the water towards Tacoma. The White River took over the channel of the Stuck River, and the Stuck River ceased to exist. So, if the White River takes over the channel of the old Stuck River, and becomes forever cut off from the Green Duwamish watershed, then there is only a single river left to feed the once mighty Duwamish, the Green River. Seattle is growing. In 1909, as the Ballard Locks were under construction, engineers began to take a look at the Duwamish River. See how it meanders back and forth very slowly across the Duwamish Valley. 
and notice the wide tidal marsh at its estuary. From the indigenous people's point of view, and also from the salmon's point of view, this was a very, very fertile ecosystem. From the industrialist point of view, with big ideas for Seattle, it seemed like maybe we could straighten this channel, dredge it out, make it deeper for the big ships, and fill in the tidal marsh with a man-made island. We could have a great port. Imagine it. And they did. We did. Seattle was built on this idea. We can straighten this river. We can build an island. We can become a major seaport. We can compete with Tacoma for the Pacific trade. This is a ghostly image. It's from 1922, where you can see the new straightened channel being dug and the broad meandering curves of the old Duwamish River still in play. The straightened channel was given a new name. What was formerly the Duwamish River has become, officially, the Lower Duwamish Waterway. It's an industrial function. Some people want to give it back its name. Some people want to honor the idea that it used to be a living river. This is what the Duwamish estuary looks like today. This is what salmon need to swim through to get to the upper reaches of the Green River. Trying to remember how the watershed used to work. In the 1930s and 40s, Seattle continues to grow. The suburbs fill up, surrounding communities grow to the north and the east and the south. The community of Kent used to get flooded on a regular basis. In 1946, the flood was so big, it inundated the entire valley. Homes, shops, and farmland ruined. Historically, when the Lower Green River Valley flooded, it was great for nature. Floodplains are very rich ecosystems, but the farms and new communities needed protection from these floods. So a dam was constructed in the Upper Green River watershed to ensure that people could effectively manage the floods, and levees were constructed all along the Green River Valley through Auburn and Kent and Renton and Tequila to keep it in its place. A reservoir filled up behind the dam and this proved to be an excellent source of drinking water for the city of Tacoma and its own rapidly growing population. A pipe was engineered to bring water from the reservoir to Tacoma, water that used to flow into the Green River and out through the Duwamish. For the right of taking the water from the Green River, Tacoma needed to develop a habitat conservation plan preparing for the day when the salmon would be able to return to the miles and miles of their historic spawning habitat above the dam. Howard Hansen Dam was completed in 1961. There was no fish passage designed to provide a way for the salmon to access the Upper Green River watershed. They were cut off, dammed, blocked, from using something like 40% of their historical habitat. That's almost half. How are we going to solve this problem? Who's working on it? Each year, I keep wondering if there might be a few dozen salmon swimming up through the green Duwamish who still carry an ancestral memory of what the watershed was like before we re-engineered it. Before the entire river was replumbed. We did this. We have all benefited from it. It happened rapidly in just the last 100 years. What is our responsibility to ourselves? to salmon, to our children, and to our grandchildren over the next 100 years. What can we do?